Welcome to Coffee with Chris. Before we dive into it, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. We're joined today by Senior Wealth Advisor from Asante Financial Management and author of Financial Empowerment for Canadian Women, Laura Southall. Welcome. Hi, Chris. Thanks so much for having me. Well, thank you for your time. Now, Laura, talk to me, Senior Wealth Advisor. Now, most people know of a financial planner, but what is a Senior Wealth Advisor? Um, a wealth advisor is more encompassing. Uh, we look at the whole picture of the finances, not just the investment. You're you're looking at how to minimize taxes, how to leave your estate to the next generation. Um, and we do planning around that. So you would have a financial plan or a retirement plan or an estate plan. So it's more all encompassing. Perfect. Because that was my, my first confusion. <laughs> but um your book, Financial Empowerment for Canadian Women. Yes. Okay. What was the drive behind making this and creating this, this book? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I started giving seminars for women uh, about 10 years ago, and I could not believe the, um, the hunger that was there. Women wanted to know. Um, they were making more money than they've ever made before. Women are more educated than they've ever been. Um, and they were recognizing that they needed to know what to do with their money. It wasn't enough to just make money. They needed to know what to do with money. And there was this drive to be able to take care of themselves uh, and their families financially. I mean, the divorce rate in Canada is 42%. Um, yeah. So over uh, it's 90% of Canadian women will be the sole head of their household at some point in their lives. And women are more and more aware of this. So I would give these seminars and they would take pages of notes. And it was really just, you know, financial literacy. But I could see that this need was there. So uh, I decided to write the book to, to meet that need. That's really cool. Now, you, you said a word there that I'm not super familiar with, financial literacy. Yeah. Can you explain what that is? Um, financial, <laughs> yeah, financial literacy. That's, it's a big word. Um, I mean, we want people, we want Canadians to be as financially literate as possible. So when you think about um, literacy in terms of being able to read, we want them to be able, when we want them to be financially literate, we want them to be able to understand what they're supposed to do with their money. And that goes beyond just paying the bills and paying your mortgage. Um, it's about what happens when you take on debt. Uh, what is your credit rating? Um, how to invest? How to save for retirement? All of those pieces. And I mean, financial literacy in Canada is not very good. Um, so my push has been financial literacy really for everybody, but I saw that there was a big need uh, in, in the women area. But I've also done tons of speaking uh, around financial literacy uh, at the secondary in the high schools uh, here. Um, I've gone in and done all kinds of programs. Um, and the government has actually added financial literacy into the grade 10 curriculum in Ontario. Most people don't know that, uh, but it's in there now. So we're definitely making steps in that direction, but um, it's still a problem in Canada. And you can tell that from the debt loads that Canadians are carrying. Right. Now, when we talk about understanding money and finances, and you said, you know, we're teaching this to the, the youth of today or the younger generation, um, yeah. you know, I remember getting an allowance as a kid and not really understanding money and the impact is financial literacy or is there a program or you know a talk where we can actually talk about emotional charges when it comes to finances especially at that younger age like how do you tell someone who's 10 here's a hundred dollars from grandma but this is what we have to do with it to to really understand this yeah it's hard um and you need to start early with kids and um not not all parents feel comfortable um, teaching that too. And, and money comes with all this emotional baggage. So 
as adults, we were influenced in our childhood by what we learned, but also the messaging around money in our household. Um, were our parents anxious around money? Were they happy around money? Um, what did we learn from not just our household either, our friends and society at large? Um, so we have all this baggage and then we have kids um, and then we're supposed to teach our kids about money, but we've already got baggage and our parents probably had baggage too. So they gave that to us. So it's this vicious cycle of how do we teach our kids about money? But to me, it starts with teaching them that money is about choice. Um, so if you understand your money, you can have choice in your life. Um, but that was a lesson that I learned myself as a child. And I don't know that everybody um, has learned that. I think oftentimes people think money equals stuff um, when in fact money gives you choice. That's really neat. I've never heard it put that way. Money is stuff, but it's actually money is choice. Now you had mentioned, you know, you were very interested in this at a younger age. What was your path or career path or choices to get into financial management? Yeah. So I, um, as a child, I uh, grew up in Brantford, Ontario, and um, my dad worked in a dry cleaning store and we didn't have a lot of extra. We lived in a little two bedroom house and, but I uh, took the city bus at cross town to go to the school um, where there were a ton of wealthy and well-educated families. So I saw all these kids that had so much. I would go over to their houses and it was crazy what they had. These giant houses with, you know, nine fireplaces and convertibles and ski chalets. It was, it was way over the top. Um, and so I thought, this seems really cool. I want this. I'm going to figure this out. So I went to the public library and I read every book on finance and money and success. And I started running small businesses um, out of my basement. I actually ran a lending company out of my basement where I would loan the neighborhood kids 25 cents and they would pay me back 30 cents on Saturday when they got their allowance, ran a day camp in my backyard for years. Um, so my drive was all about money um, and the stuff that money could buy. And then when I got to high school, um, I wanted to go to university. Uh, and I realized that my friends were all going to have the choice to go to university, but I wasn't going to have that choice. And it was like this light bulb went on. Um, money does not actually equal stuff. It equals choice. Um, so that's, I kept reading and studying and I saved a down payment for my first house by putting $50 a month into a mutual fund from when I was 15 to 22. Wow. Um, yeah, I know. Um, and then that many bought, 15 year olds can do that. <laughs> well, I was reading all these books and the book said, uh, you know, you needed to have a down payment and a job to buy real estate. And I understood the concept of real estate. Like it seemed amazing to me. Um, you know, you only have to put a small amount down, but the property appreciates and then you rent it out and the tenants pay the mortgage. It just seemed like a win-win in terms of an investment. So I studied everything to do with real estate too. Um, and then I knew I needed to buy a house the second I graduated. So I did save enough to go to university. And then I bought a house when two months after I graduated. Um, uh, and then, well, I'm dating myself. It was 1997. So the house cost. <laughs> It wasn't $1.2 million. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It was, it was 98500 Uh, And it was, and I, the down payment was 5800 And I had $6,000 saved up. Um, and uh, I, the mortgage payment was $625. And I immediately moved into the main floor and rented out the basement for $625. Um, so then I just, I thought, well, this really works. And then I, I had a job. Um, so now I was making money. Um, so I, because someone else was paying my mortgage, I was able to put $400 a month uh, into my mutual fund account. So then it took me three years to save up the money for the next one. 
And then I just kept buying houses after that, uh, houses and, and then eventually apartment buildings. Um, but that gave me um, the ability to stay at home with my three, I have three kids. Um, I stay at home with them for seven years. Again, money equals choice. I had the choice to stay at home with them. And then uh, when I came back, when my youngest daughter was uh, in kindergarten, I thought, I need a job in business. I don't, I, I have to, I have to talk about money with people. Uh, so that was 11 years ago and I uh, became a financial advisor. And then I've just been doing this for 11 years and it's been fantastic. So it's neat how you talk about these rental properties and um, you know, you, you got your first place, you rented out the basement. Now you're in department buildings and you have this choice. Um, a lot of what I'm hearing is house hacking. But house hacking is very hard to do when you have a, a, a traditional two-story home if you don't have a legal basement or a separate entrance. Yep. So in your experience, if you were going to house hack, you know, live in one floor and rent out the other, is there a kind of like a, a house landscaper design or a home that is like, hey, that's really ideal? For sure. Um, the bungalow. So a three-bedroom bungalow has a big enough footprint um, that the basement apartment is a good size. Um, and it's also usually has a side door entrance that you can sever off um, to make for a separate entrance. By far, the bungalow, the three bedroom bungalow is perfect. Even a two bedroom bungalow works too. Um, and that's what I did in the beginning. I just looked for those bungalows with the side door entr entrance. And then it's also ideal if they already have plumbing in the basement. Um, because then it's not hard to put in a bathroom or the kitchen. Um, but that was definitely what I looked for. And you know what? I went to a rental property seminar when I was 19. I was in university and I went to one just to get information because I was just collecting information like a maniac in those days. And the guy giving the seminar said, if you're here and you haven't bought your first house, buy a three bedroom bungalow with the potential for a basement apartment. Um, as your first house. And I thought that is good advice. So when I started looking, um, that was all I looked at. Harder now, I think that that was more than 25 years ago. Um, harder now, because I feel like all the baby boomers are also looking for bungalows, um, where at the time, I don't think there was the same push. Okay. And more, a lot of places around me anyway, they're being bungalows are being taken down for these large monster mansion, homes you yeah. know generational type homes yeah when we look at your book financial empowerment for canadian women if you haven't already gotten the book or if you haven't got online done the audiobook what can we learn from this book without giving it all of the way what can we learn from it yeah um well i set out to write about financial literacy so what a woman should know at different stages of her life so what she needs to know at work what she needs to know running her household, what she needs to know if she has kids, what she needs to know if she's retired. So I started writing that and I talked to different women about it um, and everyone was excited. But what I realized was everyone had baggage from their childhood, um, whether they had been influenced by a super frugal parent or an overspender parent. And I thought I need to address this first. So the first half of the book, uh, we go through sort of the influences of your childhood, uh, what money style you have, and then we acknowledge all of this. And then the second half is what you need to know. So it sort of deals with the emotional stuff first, and then here's your knowledge. And I kind of meant for it to be something that you could go back and reference, like you might be in this stage right now, but five years later, you might be in this stage. So when we talk about this book and the success of it, I want you to, there, there's something that I heard and I would love for you to, to tell me if this is true or false with it. With your book, I believe it was for the month of November and the month of December during the the peak of your book or the selling parts of your book, that you actually donated proceeds to a charity organization that helps out young women called Girls Inc. Yeah, that's right. So um, I'm on the board of Girls Inc., but um, I wanted to donate the profit from the sale of the book um, to Girls Inc. because their mission statement is to inspire girls to be strong, smart, and bold. 
and they provide all kinds of pre-programming uh, to that end. So think after school programming, summer camps, that kind of thing, um, to inspire girls to be strong, smart, and bold. And I thought, this is what the book is kind of about too. I want to inspire women to be strong, smart, and bold, and to be able to take care of themselves financially. So with your book and, and everything that you've written in there, when you look back at your path and you say, geez, you know, I wish there was something that someone told me that just would have been a light bulb moment in year number one, not necessarily year number 20. What's that one piece of advice you wish someone would have told you earlier? I don't know. I got a lot of really good advice early. I think um, I was very, very appreciative of the advice I got. Um, but I would say that someone maybe could have told me to relax a bit. because I'm super, <laughs> <laughs> I'm super intense. And I sometimes think, it's time to slow down a bit. Um, I didn't have to, you know, buy my first house when I was 23. I could have traveled for a few years and uh, relaxed, but that was not my uh, mindset at the time. I was so driven to create stability, financial stability for myself that um, it, that came at a cost for sure. Now, when we look at all of the information and misinformation that's out there and there's a lot around money specifically, you know, invest mm -hmm. in Bitcoin, invest in um, whatever, whatever those little pigeons are called. I can't remember now, but yeah. how do you cut through that clutter to say, you know, oh, it's NFT, my apologies. How do you cut through the clutter of information and misinformation to know what to focus on? Yeah, that's, it's really hard. There is so much out there and the internet has made it just a, uh, a, um, like a big cesspool of information and you don't know what to trust or what's specific to your situation. It's kind of why I wrote the book because I wanted, it's not that complicated really money. So I wanted women to have something that was reliable and, and coming from a woman also um, that they could reference because I feel like if you try and search something on the internet, you're getting so much information um, and this is concrete. This, the book is set out to be, this is what you need to know. These are the steps you need to take. Um, I wrote it as if I was talking to my sister or my best friend. This is what I would tell you. That's really cool. When we look at your book, we can get it on Amazon. Is there an audiobook version? Where can we find your book outside of just Googling it? Yeah, it's on Amazon. That's the easiest way. There's a... Um, there's a soft cover on amazon.ca and there's a hard cover on amazon.com. Um, and then a few local bookstores are carrying it as well, but it's not in Indigo. And where can people learn more about Laura Southall, your journey and the empowerment in your book? Is there Instagram? Um, is there Facebook? Where can we find you? Yeah, there's everything. Uh, Laura, at Laura Southall Finance is the handle and it's there's Instagram, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, I have a YouTube channel too. Um, and th those would be the main, uh, ways, but, uh, yeah, Instagram is my primary, but everything gets po posted as well. Now, when we look at financial literacy and financial wealth, if somebody says, Hey, you know what? Um, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. Can we, can they reach out to you at Asante financial management and say, Hey, you know, I know you're not in Burlington, you're not in Guelph, but can we, are you restricted to a territory? Can you talk to anybody? I can talk to anyone in Ontario. Um, so yes, and I do have lots of clients. I have Brantford, Hamilton, Burlington, Oakville, Mississauga. I have lots of clients all um, in that area. Um, we do everything on Zoom uh, now, so it makes it even easier. I used to drive down, um, but now we just Zoom, which is fantastic. So yes, if people have questions, they, they can certainly reach out to me um, and my email is everywhere on the internet. Fabulous. I have time for one last question for you, Laura. Okay. What makes Laura Southall smile? Uh, my kids. Uh, I have three teenagers. I have twins who are 17 and a 15 year old, and they're just great human beings. And I, uh, I just adore them. They, they make me happy. Brilliant. I love that. Uh, that's all the time we have with Coffee with Chris. Our guest today, Laura Southall, thank you so much for your time. Get a copy of Financial Empowerment for Canadian Women. 
Get a hold of Laura Southall if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Have a fantastic day, everybody, and smile to inspire.